for all of this, these things that happen. Uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of subprime? At least uh, read some stories about that. Okay, quite a few of you, right. Uh, subprime simply means that they were making loans to people who normally couldn't get loans because they didn't, well, I think I put, yeah, I put Ninja on the end there. Uh, no income, no job, no assets, that idea. And people were getting, college students were getting loans. Uh, and they had you know, incomes of $12,000 a year and with no assets and no credit history and so on. A lot of story behind that. But basically what was happening was the loans that were being made were much, much riskier, which ties into our theme. The banks weren't as worried about it because they could turn around and sell it to somebody else. They were not going to be subject to the loss. And they could take the money that they got from selling it to somebody else and relend that. Right? And that's how banks make money. Right? So that, that worked well. And the argument for doing that was that that made more money available for people to, to uh, borrow and they could buy houses. So the good intentions behind this whole program were that more Americans should own their own homes. A very old idea. FDR, way back in the 30s, uh, talked about that all the way forward. Republicans, Democrats, doesn't split uh, party-wise. So home ownership is a good thing. How can we make that happen? This was it. We should lend to people who are really not that credit worthy, uh, but we got them covered. You know, it'll be okay. And the adjustable rate mor mortgages. Those are where you get a teaser rate. So you go one, two, three years with a fairly low interest rate, and then suddenly they, it begins to adjust according uh, to some model that they use, okay? uh, calculation. So as long as I'm gonna flip this house, what do I care if the interest rate goes up three years from now? I won't be here then. Don't worry about it. Okay? So they buy the house with, with the ARM. Also, some of the subprime uh, loans were interest only loans. Now it's hard for people who don't have much money to make much of a payment, obviously, and they have to pay something. And so the way some of those loans worked was they only had to pay the interest on the loan, none of the underlying part that they borrowed. And that kept their payments down, right? So they could afford to be in a house. Uh, you will all run into some salesperson who tries to convince you to buy something based upon it's only gonna cost you and they'll split it to you know, so many dollars a day, you know, whatever it takes to get you to buy that thing, that's what they'll do. People buy cars like that all the time. You don't look at how much you're gonna pay for that car with, all, with the interest and so on. It's, what's the monthly payment? Right. If I can, oh, I can afford that, all right, I can buy the car. And that's the way these things went. Now, there were some assumptions built into this that gets us to the big part. Right. First of all, these were being sold on the secondary market, let me keep going here, to some of these entities. Uh, these are nicknames for agencies of the federal government. Uh, Fannie Mae is FNMA, uh, Freddie Mac, I don't know how they got that out there, it was uh, FHLMC. Um, those are agencies that guarantee loans and, and, and that uh, buy loans, I'm sorry, that buy loans from banks. And they were created by the federal government. So they're government sponsored enterprises, the GSEs. And everybody knows that. So because everybody knows that, they're thinking, okay, if this is backed by these guys, I'm home free. There's gonna be no risk in this. This has got the United States government behind it. So this, this will be a low risk situation because you've got a guaranteed loan. Uh, uh, many of you in here are familiar with government guaranteed loans. It's what enables a lot of you to be here. So it's the same sort of thing. These things enable people to get into houses and your situation allows people to get into college. Same kind of idea. The intentions are, more people should go to college. The intentions were more people should be in their own homes. Right? So good intentions behind the programs. These acronyms right here, that's uh, mortgage-backed securities and uh, uh, collateralized debt obligations. I don't get into those, but once these entities begin buying up these mortgages, it's no longer that one-to-one -one thing when the, the lady goes into George Bailey's office uh, and they can talk about the mortgage. These are not individual mortgages anymore. They're all put together in big lots, all right? That's where we start getting big. This is the first level of aggregation that gets us to the too big to fail thing. They take all these things and they put them together and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and there's also Ginnie Mae, that's the oldest one, they purchased these. At one time, these entities held 90% of the mortgages in the United States, all right? It was huge, right? It was really, really big. 
And when things like that happen, if anything goes wrong, everybody's heard the, that old saying, uh, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Yeah, that's, that was this. And so things were, were getting very, very big, but it was still working because everything was stable. Somebody in the back probably can't see this. The name of that bank is Improvident Bank. Uh, that's not a good thing, in case you're wondering. <coughs> but there's a seal on the window there, excuse me, that uh, says FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. The idea is that the government's got your back. They are going to guarantee if something goes wrong, I get my money. Well, moral hazard refers to, it's usually used in insurance, but in other contexts as well. Moral hazard refers to the situation where if you know that somebody's got the downside, you don't have to worry too much about it. And we tend to make riskier decisions as a result of that. Now, you've probably seen a show uh, someplace where uh, somebody's car is being destroyed or something along those lines. And he's all distraught and the other person says, oh, don't worry about it, it's insured. That's that. I don't have to be careful, it's insured. Right? If you don't have that coverage on the downside, everybody's more careful. And so what this cartoon illustrates is you've got the depositor there on the right-hand side. He's basically saying, I don't have to be prudent. I don't have to be careful. Government's got my back. I can take risks. Right? And that is the genesis of what eventually crashed in 2008. Uh, is people were put in a situation where they didn't have to be careful because there's the prospect of, of a subsidy being bailed out, being rescued sometime later on. All right, what else happened? Uh, housing values always go up. That's the mantra. Uh, and if they don't always go up, housing, real estate is always local. If anything bad happens, it's only going to happen in Michigan or it's only going to happen in, in Nevada. It won't happen everywhere. Critical assumptions turned out to be wrong, both of them real estate values started going down. Remember, they were counting on that going up so they could flip these houses. Real estate values are going down, that means that people don't want to buy as many houses. That's why they're going down. And so now you're holding on to real estate longer than what you intended to. The Fed there refers to the Federal Reserve, that's the United States Central Bank. Uh, they raised interest rates several times got up over five percent if I remember right remember those people with the adjustable rate mortgages and the interest only mortgages uh oh hey okay. now they're in trouble now they're in trouble they no longer qualify they can't make the payments uh, you've probably heard that the, it was the subprime part of this that uh, ruined everything and those people shouldn't have had loans and so on and so forth uh, but the last set of statistics that I read indicated that the incidence of defaults was higher for ARMs, for adjustable rate mortgages, than it was for the subprime. So the people that really got surprised were the ones on, on the adjustable rate mortgages. Uh, and when it adjusted upward, they couldn't pay anymore. And because they were the loan to value ratio, sorry, the jargon, but they were also allowed to borrow a lot more than 80%. Uh, I, I was offered a loan at 125% of my house's value. <laughs> That's not prudent lending, um, not just because of me, but uh, it's just not a good idea. Yeah, that's uh, $25,000 of that, uh, if it's a $100,000 house, is unsecured. And the rest of it they're probably not going to get because it was going to be a, a fire sale. They have to sell it in a hurry. So they're not going to get the full $100,000. So they're going to take a bath on that. But everybody thought everything was wonderful and it was going to keep going up and there was no problem. And so crazy stuff like that began to happen. People were taking risks uh, way beyond what they would if we didn't have these backstops. All right, so you see this mortgage statement says past due. Uh-oh, what am I going to do? Uh, The person at the bottom is thinking about paying or not paying. If they default, remember the loans were purchased. They're no longer with that local bank. You can't go to the local bank and say, hey, I'm, I'm in trouble, I lost my job, I got laid off, I can't make this payment. Those have been purchased and they're someplace out there. And they've all been aggregated, they've all been put together. And then they've been resold, that's what that 
MBS and the CDO was referring to. They've been resold in various very complicated forms uh, at values that are almost impossible to, to fathom uh, in terms of how they got to the values. And so people own these people, entities own these mortgages. People are supposed to be making the payments. They don't make the payments. And now what we have, and now we're getting to the big guys, we have assets on the books of large organizations that suddenly don't have value or are decreasing in value. Okay? Now these particular entities, refer to them typically as banks, but they're uh, at least two kinds of banks. These banks don't take deposits. That's not what they're there for. It's not, it's not like our local banks you go in and put money in an account. These are investment banks. They lend money, they borrow money. Uh, that's what they do. They may have some other kinds of assets, but generally not. Uh, it's, it's all financial, uh, financial intermediation. So the result is that these entities had these aggregations of mortgages and suddenly they became less valuable. What happens now? Okay. For you accountants out there, this is balance sheet stuff, right? <laughs> this is the left side of your balance sheet. Uh, <coughs> your asset values are going down. And that means you, if you had any equity on the other side, uh, most of you can, you can tune out for this second right here. Uh, the equity on your other side just disappears. Right. Houses all over the place. Right. So you could go back and try to foreclose on all these things, but everything's been all split up. You can have a single mortgage and several different organizations could actually own pieces of that mortgage, that one mortgage. And so you have empty houses all over the place, people just leaving their houses, moving away, letting it go back, as they say, and that's it. Some of them signing deeds uh, back uh, and so on. Okay. There were some mortgage companies uh, that went belly up during this time, um, I mean, Countrywide Financial, some others like that, that you might have heard about. So this is where we get to the aggregation, the big part, is it started with just regular people doing normal things, getting a mortgage on a house, American dream, and just because of what was allowed financially to happen, these things became bigger and bigger and bigger and got owned by very large, very, very large enterprises. And what happened? These large enterprises do something that, that you should not do. It's not prudent for us to do. Uh, and that is to borrow short and lend long, basically. Uh, those mortgages are gonna pay back over several years. But these organizations borrow money very short term, at six months, sometimes overnight. And they expect to roll those loans over. In other words, nobody expects them to really pay it off. People are making money because they're getting the interest on the money that's, that's being borrowed. And so if I borrowed from uh, Bank of America, for example, I could go to Bank of America and I just roll over my million dollar loan. I, pay them the interest on it, and they would re-lend it to me, so I still owe them a million dollars. Well, if I have one of those aggregations of mortgages, uh, a CDO, for example, and someone thinks it's not worth much because they hear what's going on out in the world, and I go to get that short-term loan, they may say no. Because you don't have enough assets to cover it. Well, if they say no, now I can't pay what I need to pay. I may have to sell some other things. If I have to sell them in a hurry, I'll probably sell them cheap, like anybody who has to sell something in a hurry. That's why going out of business sales, you know, trying to get rid of stuff, which means their asset picture looks even worse. And now we've got other organizations that because they won't lend money to this organization, right, this organization then can't deal with other organizations for which it might supply funds from time to time. Those organizations are then affected and you have a ripple effect. All of these banks, and I haven't named any of them except I think it's the Bank of America, uh, all these banks are interconnected. And so it's not necessarily really big as much as it is connected, intertwined, entangled, if you will. So that when one suffers, it has this domino effect and they all begin having trouble. Right? That's the idea. Hard to picture all that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I
I can't say good intentions because you know they were going to destroy planets with this thing. Uh, but the original idea sounded like such a good idea. Right? We're all we're all big and bad, right? This is a good idea. And yet, when it started to go, nobody knew how to stop it. Right? Nobody knew how to stop it. Uh, there was a vulnerability just like the Death Star that they discovered and exploited. Uh, and in this situation, there was nobody discovering and exploiting it. I, I suppose some people were doing what we call shorting uh, at the time, but, uh, which means they were counting on things getting worse and could make money that way. But when things started to go, they had to have a meeting. And they had the a meeting with the heads of the largest banks and uh, AIG, uh, which was an insurance company, not a bank, an insurance company. It got bailed out. Uh, the head of the Federal Reserve, that would have been uh, Ben Bernanke at the time. Uh, also the president of the New York Fed, that would have been a guy named Tim Geithner. And the Treasury Secretary, which was Henry or Hank Paulson. And you know these are tops of everything. They get together, and there's a great book, it's called Too Big to Fail, by a guy who was uh, at a lot of these meetings, so he tells you exactly what they were saying and why. It's frightening, it's absolutely frightening. Okay. Uh, it looks like they didn't have a clue. And things are happening very, very rapidly. It's like, if we don't get this much, if we don't get so many billion dollars by next Monday, we're, we're done. And sometimes if we don't get it by tomorrow morning, we're done. And then they get that and uh, they, they do some things and then they need it by the day after that. Or they're done. And so on. And so that's why this meeting right here is help. Okay? Uh, that's the image you get from the biggest babies, right? Babies cry. That's it. Uh, when they want to be fed, they cry. I mean, that's just about all they cry about. So they're uncomfortable. That's what was happening. It's like, help, this is going down. Why do we care? Let them, let them die, right? Just let them go down. Remember what I said about repurposing and all those kinds of things? Right? Well, they were worried about us. They were worried about Main Street, as they call it now, outside of Wall Street. People who had you know, real jobs and, and factories that made real things and provided real services and so on, uh, as opposed to just financial transactions. And the idea was, if this part of the system goes down, all those businesses out there who need working capital loans and so on, there will be a liquidity crisis. Liquidity just refers to how easily you can get money, uh, either by selling stuff you have or borrowing it, and it just won't be available. The whole system will crash, and, no, and, and then the entire economy will crash, um, and it'll be helped along by people's loss of confidence in the system. Say, oh, the system doesn't work. Uh, what happens when you panic the system doesn't work? You pull in, right? You don't spend money. Right? You don't build the new plant. You don't hire the new employees. Everybody holds tight because things are really bad. And that's, that's a wise thing to do. Right? You don't know what's going to happen, so don't do anything. Well, what does that do to the economy? Makes it even worse. Okay? And, it, and it spirals down, spirals down, and, and there's a depression. Right? And, and you have people jumping off buildings and so on. Right? Really, really bad. So that's what happened. That's why they were concerned about this uh, and why they got together and decided what to do. Now, in the background, of course, is all these people are very interested in their own positions and their own financial uh, situation and those kinds of things as well. You can't separate that. So. The bailout. The initial bailout, TARP refers to Troubled Asset Relief Program. They have these bad assets, the ones I mentioned. It came from those mortgages, and there were things besides mortgages, actually car loans and some other things in there. But uh, what are we going to do about that? And here are the companies. J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, most of you are familiar with that. Uh, Wells Fargo, it's got Wachovia above it because they, in the course of the manipulations here, they purchased Wachovia because Wachovia was failing. Uh, then we got Goldman Sachs, everybody's heard of Goldman Sachs, right? Presidents have to hire Goldman Sachs people. Um, it's in the Constitution someplace, I think. <laughs> and Citigroup, right? some of you might even have accounts at, at these banks. And the initial TARP bailout amount, and this was coming from the United States government, was $700 billion. And that was supposed to help them weather this particular storm, sort a few things out. Uh, some companies would go under, some would not. 
And by the way, let me back up a little bit by history. This happened in September of 2008. Earlier that year, they had uh, worked out a deal where J.P. Morgan Chase bought a company called Bear Stearns. They were in trouble, so they got bought by another company, and that was how that happened. By the way, bailouts aren't just giving people money. Here, have some money, uh, and you're better off. Uh, very often it was, it was this company's going to buy you, right? and, and that's the way that's going to work. Uh, we were talking about GM a little bit earlier. Hey, GM, uh, we're going to get you through this, but uh, we're going to own a piece of you. Uh, you're going to issue stock, and we're going to own you, which means we're going to tell you what to do, and, and so on and so forth, uh, as far as even changing the CEO and, and uh, making management decisions. So uh, that happened. The next one that came along was a, a company called Lehman, mid-sized company. They were in trouble. They wanted to be helped, and the guy said no. We're not going to help you. So they went bankrupt. And then the connections began to be apparent. Right? So the next ones that came along, they didn't do the same thing. But Lehman was allowed to go bankrupt. The next big one was AIG. Uh, again, that was an insurance company, not an investment bank. Uh, but they had been insuring investment uh, transactions. And so they were in trouble. How big are these banks? They're big. They're really big. Right. I know you can't see this, but you should get a sense for this. Each line at, on the left-hand side is a separate bank. Uh, it looks like the, the brackets of the NCAA tournament or something here. Okay. It works the same way, uh, except instead of somebody being beaten and going home, they get absorbed. Right. And so these get bigger and bigger and bigger as you go to the right. Now in the NCAA, it's better, 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 but this is bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, you see Citigroup at the top, didn't their Citigroup, uh, Citigroup up there did not do very much of this, but the rest of them did. And the last arms that you see right here, we can't read any of these dates here, but these last arms tell us that that was 2008. Those are banks that were being purchased uh, by other banks to try to keep banks from failing. That was, that was the idea. And, there were not choices. All of these people are getting together and say, okay, it looks like this is what we're going to have to do. Um, nope, sorry, you can't hesitate. <laughs> we're buying you tomorrow. Uh, there was one CEO. They said to him, you're gone. That's it. Well, well, who's going to come in? Well, this other guy, Ed. I, really? Okay. Um, I guess that's all right. Uh, so they're making decisions like that. With what information? I mean, they were doing it in a matter of minutes sometimes. The way this thing turned over, it was, it was happening so fast. Uh, so if I can tell you some of these things here, this is Wells Fargo down at the bottom here, and the last company that they purchased was Wachovia. You saw that earlier. And notice that they kind of went together. It wasn't just a, a purchase uh, like some of the others. Here's Bank of America. And earlier, MBNA and U.S. Trust had, had been picked up. But Countrywide and Merrill Lynch right here, these were two companies, or two entities in trouble, and so they picked them up. That was all part of this deal. So Bank of America had to do that. This is J.P. Morgan Chase. They got Washington Mutual. Sometimes you see it as WAMU sometimes. Uh, and here's Bear Stearns way back here. That's what happened there. And Citigroup uh, didn't do any of that. So you can see that the, what's happened to the banks, they got larger and larger and larger. Well, if part of the problem was that they were big, this is making them even bigger. And now we're getting into too big to fail. If one of these guys goes down, probably everybody goes down with them. That's the idea of too big to fail. It didn't start with this particular crisis. It, uh, it was an older idea. Uh, but this made it really, really clear. Right? Again, there are economists, and I happen to agree with them, that it's not the size per se. Uh, it's the interconnectedness of this. And so it's the size of the system rather than the individual pieces. Right? Well, that's kind of interesting because if we begin looking at interconnected systems like the healthcare system, for example, you know, is healthcare too big to fail? If we treat it as one thing, it probably is, right? which is, we're, they're talking about uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and so on right now. But if somebody gets into that, oh, it's too big to fail, or it's too interconnected, or we're too entangled to extract ourselves from this or extricate our, uh, ourselves from this, we can't touch it. It's too interconnected. 
Uh, so I think that's actually more accurate than too big to fail. It's too entangled. Right? Too entangled to extricate. Right? We're there. I have to slow down when I say that. You probably a, a, a medical analogy, I suppose, is uh, someone has has a tumor, and the tumor is too connected to allow them to do surgery. You'd like to get rid of that terrible thing. We'd like to cut that out, but it's got connections to things that we can't separate, and so there it is. We just can't do anything about it. That may be the picture that we're seeing going forward with uh, healthcare and some other things like that. All right, more subtle aspects of this. If people know that you can't fail or that you'll be rescued because you're too big to fail, they're more apt to lend you money. And so you can borrow money more cheaply, more easily, if you're in this category of likely to be, to be bailed out by the government or the Federal Reserve, by the central bank. What that means is that an entity that gets itself into that category has an advantage, a competitive advantage, over the other banks who aren't in that category because they can borrow money more cheaply. Now, who backs them up? Oh, it's the government, right? But where's the government get its money? From you, yes, okay? And your long-suffering parents and, and so on and so on, all the other uh, taxpayers. So the taxpayers then are subsidizing these very, very large, very wealthy entities so they can get a better deal. That's the coddling that goes on. These are very large, very powerful entities, and yet they're being subsidized on a constant basis by the taxpayers because they get a better deal as a result of their getting into this category where they're backed. Okay. More moral hazard. Okay. And if these are backed, and we're moving on from Fannie Mae and, and uh, Jenny Mae and Freddie Mac and so on, uh, to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, so on. Those entities then don't have to be as careful because they can make decisions and they know that somebody's likely to be there to bail them out. And so again, more moral hazard. They take greater risks with the assets that they have. The incentives are to not be prudent, to not be wise, to take chances, to increase risk, because with increased risk comes increased return. And that's what they're in business for, is a return on uh, their owners. And so that's, they're for their owners. And that's what the incentives are. They will push in that direction. Other incentives. It's good to be big. How can we get big? Now, if you get big, like Walmart, by just selling more and more and more and more stuff at cheaper and cheaper prices, well, OK. But you can get big just by aggregation. Just go buy a bunch of companies, and suddenly you're big. And you're not big because anybody liked what you were doing. You're big because you managed to buy up a bunch of companies. And so you get that aggregation, the incentive to merge, uh, to take over the co other companies, and so on. Um, and those marriages very often don't work out very well. So what did they do about all this when we got out the other side? The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Right? Dodd-Frank for short. Uh, that's Dodd and Frank in reverse order. This is Dodd, that's Frank. Right? Uh, those are last names. That's Chris Dodd and Barney Frank. This was supposed to put the clamps on all these guys. Okay, we're gonna bail you out, but you need to have learned your lesson. Right? We're gonna watch you. And you're gonna tell us what you're doing. 20,000 pages of regulations later. What kind of company can handle that kind of regulatory burden? Got to be pretty big. These companies have entire departments to deal with uh, complying with these regulations, compliance departments. Smaller banks, not so much. And the limit 
to be under Dodd-Frank, uh, unless they've changed it recently, is $50 billion. That's not that much in the, in the banking industry. And so you have some medium banks that have a huge regulatory burden now, and they're at a competitive disadvantage to the big guys. The big guys are pretty much okay with this. They can handle that regulation. Little guys can't. So why would you want to be big? Big companies very often ask for regulation. They think, most people think, well, businesses hate regulation. No, not if the regulation falls more harshly on your competitors than it does on you. Because it's all about competitive advantage. And if you can actually help the government write those regulations, because if you're big, you've got lots of lawyers and lobbyists and so on and so forth, even better. And so you end up with a legal situation that is beneficial to you and hurts your competitors. All right, here's, that's weird. Living wills, what does that have to do? Don't know who drafted this exactly, but the idea of a living will actually comes out of probate practice. Okay. Don't know why they decided on that. Even scripture talks about wills. Wills are not effective until somebody dies. It says so right in the Bible. Okay. So if you do a will and it means this is my will, what I want to happen for when I die. I want my kids to have it or you know, whatever it happens to be. That's a will. Well, a living will isn't talking about a, a will as opposed to a dead will. It's talking about the person who makes it is living. So what a living will is supposed to do is express your will for when you're really, really sick and can't make your own decisions. Okay. Whether or not you want the plug pulled on you or not. That kind of thing. That's what a living will is. Regular will is for when you die. A living will is while you're still alive, but you need to tell somebody what to do when you're in a really bad way. So it actually fits, although it's an odd, odd choice of terms, what these big banks are supposed to do and have on record all the time is a living will. They're supposed to have a document that says exactly how they're going to get out of trouble if they get in trouble. If they get really, really sick, they have to have this document that says how they're supposed to get out. And that has to be approved by the regulators, and there are lots of regulators. Lots and lots of regulators. This is just the Dodd-Frank stuff. There are lots of other regulations as well. Okay? So lots of entanglements, but if you're big enough, you can handle that. It's the little guys that are going to get squeezed out because they can't afford it. To bring this down to our level, we can't see any of that, but anybody notice that that free checking account isn't free anymore? And you're suddenly paying for various accounts and so on? That's all part of this. The banks, they're gonna make money someplace, right? and if they have to, if they lose it on the right, they'll make it on the left. And so free checking gone, and then an increase in fees. Uh, over here, it's talking about getting rid of ATM machines, so the cost then becomes your convenience. You can't have access to funds as easily as you used to have it, and so on and so on. And there's just a number, I'm not sure what the date on this is, that is costing everybody about $130 a year. And some of it you can't even judge, right? because of convenience and those kinds of things. So that's some of the fallout uh, on ordinary people, in addition to, of course, paying for the initial bailout. The head of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon, uh, mentioned this concept actually comes more from Warren Buffett, a famous uh, investor. Dodd-Frank, this law, puts a moat around his company. In order to do what he does or what they do, you'd have to be able to handle things the way they handle them, and there are very few entities that can do that. And so what Dodd-Frank does is it puts a barrier to entry around them so that others can't compete with them. It's just too expensive too complicated, too involved. Not the original intention right, is uh, to reduce competition, but that's the effect of it, is it ends up reducing competition. So these guys now are in the castle and they're protected. Now they gotta deal with the king and that sort of thing, but they have less worries about their competitors. So even with Dodd-Frank, good intentions, Supposedly going to fix everything. 
Are we back to our moral hazard, false sense of security? Those people in Washington know what they're doing. We're okay. We can invest. Or are we back to distorting decisions about risk? And again, our entire economy is affected by this. This is not just something that happens in Detroit or Chicago or someplace like that. I like the image here. This is not my phrase. Are we merely continuing a high stakes game of whack-a-mole? I like that game. You just sit there and wait, right? You've got to be ready. And when one pops his head up, bam, you nail him, hey? you hope. But you've got to be fast. Okay? And sometimes you can anticipate and sometimes you can't. But that's your job. Just whack them as they come up. All right? So that's the idea. Is, do they really know what's going on? The people who are now supposed to be protecting us are the same people who didn't see the thing coming last time. Oh, I should mention that after the crisis and all the to-do, um, I don't know how many quarters it was after the end of that, but Goldman Sachs set a record for bonuses. That means extra money to their managers, the people who did all of the things that we had to bail them out for. The numbers on the size of these banks. These are trillions. Those are trillions of dollars, right? assets. These banks are huge. Right? Notice that the top four, those are the ones that on the other charts and so on, drop very, very rapidly number five and six. You get a little flavor of it there, but this one does it a little bit better. The top six banks have 67% of the assets held by these banks. Right? Almost 7,000 other banks have the other. That's how big these are. Right? So when things happen to them, that's why the Secretary of the Treasury jumps, the, the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman jumps, the, the President of uh, New York Fed jumps, it's serious, serious business. Those are big eggs. That's a little basket. I, that doesn't look good. All right. Okay. We have a few minutes for some questions on that, as long as you don't get too far off into CDOs and that sort of thing because most people in here won't get that. So questions about any of this? You should leave here with lots of questions. I can't believe they did that. Are we all going to die? That sort of thing. <laughs> all right, you finance people. I know you're just right on the edge of your seats. Um, we can talk afterwards perhaps, all right? So thank you all for your patience. I know it was very technical. Mm -hmm.